Good afternoon to everyone tuning in for this Facebook Live. Um, my name is Christopher C. And I work with American Spaces at the US Consulate General in Johannesburg. It's my absolute privilege this afternoon to facilitate our conversation with Professor Sina. Um, to that end, please allow me to introduce you to our public affairs officer um, at the US Consulate General here in Joburg, Jennifer Bullock. We will tell you a bit more about Prof. Sina. And after Prof. Sina's conversation with and presentation, I will convey your questions to him and in the, for the live discussion. But in the meantime, please ask your questions in the chat window. And with that, over to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Chris. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this Facebook Live. I'm Jennifer Bullock, the Public Affairs Officer at the U.S. Consulate in Johannesburg, as Chris said. And I'm so honored, we're all honored to have with us today the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Internationalization at the University of Johannesburg, Professor Saurabh Sinha. Professor Sinha was appointed Deputy Vice Chancellor in December 2017, and before that, held a four-year term as Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment at the University of Johannesburg. And today he will chat with us about Millimeter Wave, which is a wavelength that enables extremely high speed transmission of data. Uh, I think we've all heard of 5G um, and many 5G networks use this millimeter or MM wave, if I understood correctly. I'm looking forward to learning more about this today. We are really fortunate to have the Deputy Vice Chancellor join us virtually to share with our STEAM Club participants information about this technology. Um, so thank you, Professor Sinha. And um, without further ado, I'll turn the chat over to you. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks very much, Jennifer and Chris, uh, for this uh, introduction. And uh, of course, to the listeners and to the viewers, uh, thank you for your time this afternoon. Uh, I feel very much privileged because we're able during this lockdown period to be able to continue our engagement uh, with you uh, in a virtual format. And of course, uh, some of you are uh, receiving this uh, through audio and others both audio and video. And the underlying technology that is that you're most likely using, especially if you're using video, uh, is uh, 4G technology, uh, which we, we have been using in South Africa for a couple of years. Uh, in some cases, your mobile phone uh, may have switched to 3G technology, uh, depending on the kind of, uh, of, 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 of access that you have. And in some viewers may be utilizing uh, fiber or ADSL technology, but I think it would be a different type of, of uh, technologies. So this afternoon, uh, we're going to be talking about one uh, kind of, uh, of the technology, uh, which is called uh, millimeter wave uh, communication systems. And um, I want to once again uh, acknowledge, I want to acknowledge the uh, American Corners uh, of West Honoria and uh, Mangaung, as well as the Rosa Parks Library for joining us and uh, with uh, gratitude to the uh, U.S. Uh, consulate uh, in Joburg that has been uh, very kind uh, to facilitate this for us. Uh, the, th this presentation, uh, the, the target audience that I have uh, in, uh, I've prepared for is for uh, students at the pre-university uh, or learners at the pre-university level. So I'm going to try my best uh, to um, you know, speak to this technology and, and in a way that I hope that you would also develop appreciation uh, for this work, uh, which we do uh, at the University of Johannesburg. Um, I'm going to, the outline of the presentation is, uh, I'll try to sketch the context or the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, that I'll develop the approach thereafter. Uh, I'll identify the research gap that we uniquely address uh, at the university. Uh, and, and our thinking on how to solve this particular problem and the multidisciplinary context. Uh, you know, we often talk about this scenario today as uh, not just STEM, uh, but we talk about it as team. 
uh, where uh, you know the, the standing is for science, uh, engineering, arts, uh, technology, and mathematics. And so there's also the aspect of the A, the art, the art component, uh, which has always been very key uh, in the way that uh, technologies are deployed, especially if they are to be uh, to the benefit of humanity. So uh, I know when you expected a presentation on, uh, on on millimeter wave technology, you expected me to show you something about telecommunications, but I'm going to, to allow you to step back a bit and I'll come to the telecommunications part a little later, but uh, I want you to step back. Um, I know that at the moment we're in lockdown. So if you're probably looking at the roads, it's not even as busy as what you see on the chart. But I want to show you, this is a picture of, uh, of the highway between Pretoria, uh, between Johannesburg and Pretoria uh, on a quiet day. And so they're not that much, there's not a lot of traffic uh, at the moment. Uh, now I'm gonna show you another picture, which is uh, the same highway on a busy road, on a busy day, on a busy period of the day. Uh, and this kind of happens uh, each, uh, each day. And, and the road usually tends to look uh, very busy as you see on this chart. So what is clear here is that, you know, when roads become so busy, people are stuck in traffic. Uh, people are stuck in traffic. They don't have, uh, it's not the best usage of their time. Uh, and, and in many cases, it's therefore not also good for the economy. Uh, it's an inconvenience, it creates frustrations, it creates road rage. Um, and, and in a way, uh, it might not be very different uh, from some of you who may be experiencing difficulties in accessing this presentation, you may be finding yourself somewhat clogged uh, because your internet speed may not be good uh, or you may not have enough money to, uh, to get the best kind of video. So those, that consideration is not very different to how people experience busy roads. So how do we get over when we have a busy road? Uh, and there are different type of strategies that we use. Uh, we tend to think about maybe building new roads. Uh, we think about building alternative roads. We think about maybe looking at alternative transport mechanisms. Uh, we think about uh, widening the roads. Uh, sometimes maybe we think about flying cars uh, when we're really frustrated. So the the, you know, most of these approaches, you know, if you want to build a new road, uh, you'd have to consult with the communities, you'd have to consult with environmental authorities, you'd have to consult with different authorities to ensure that the road that you build is really uh, meaningful and adds value to people in a multifaceted way. Um, so the one mechanism of solving this is to build new roads and another mechanism is to look at widening the road. So I want to, uh, you, you to remember that aspect that one way is actually widening of the roads. And that is something that we did uh, between Johannesburg and Pretoria uh, over the last uh, decade and a half was we expanded our road system and our road network uh, and it led to a number of disputed things, aspects as well, but uh, this was one way that we used to try to, to reduce the traffic that is on, on these highways. So this is one important, if you're taking notes, uh, this is one important takeaway, is that one approach to solve the problem of high traffic is to widen the road. So that is an important takeaway, and I'll come back to this later. Now, I'm going to move now into wireless technologies. Now, wireless technologies have been around uh, forever. Uh, they've come about in different forms and they've evolved over time. So in this image, uh, this is a probably the most uh, primitive uh, or the oldest type of technology that is being used here, which is smoke. And here you see that these are red Indians that are using smoke to communicate with one another and they use different shades of the smoke uh, and they use, uh, you know, as the smoke comes on and it then switches off and then it comes on and off. And the number of times this came about then gave a particular signal to people that may be on another part of, of, of the terrain. And that was the oldest kind of wireless encounter that you can think about. 
Then in the, 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 the folks in China took this uh, further when they built the Great Wall. And in fact, when they built the Great Wall, they had all these uh, little uh, posts uh, in between, uh, you know, these, these kind of uh, you know, huts that, that are on the, on the Great Wall. And these, these are basically used then to have, they have chimneys and you can then uh, have smoke produced which is again uh, used as a form of communication. So the aspect of communication is something that humanity has desired and all the time, and it has enabled humanity uh, in the past. Now, often when we think about uh, telecommunications or communication technology, we often think about engineers. But I wanted to, you know, especially looking at the STEAM part and the multidisciplinary disciplines part. I wanted to reflect a little here, and I on the on the left hand side of the of the screen, you would notice that I have two kites, um, and this these two kites were actually an invention by a dentist, so not an engineer, a dentist, uh, whose name was Lomas, and he had a patent a patent established in 1872, so quite a while ago. And Lomas's patent was kind of interesting. You know, what he did here was he put two kites on uh, that were apart by a distance and he connected the, both of the kites to ground, to the earth. And then he disconnected one of the kites on the left. And when he disconnected the, the kite on the left, he hypothesized, he, he had a hypothesis that the kite on the right, which is apart by a certain amount of distance, actually will carry some electricity. And so he put a small galvanometer there, uh, or an ammeter to measure current. And when he did that, he found that there was some deflection. So this was perhaps one of the earliest forms of wireless uh, technology that, that occurred. Uh, and then the the forms then evolved, uh, you know, with different persons uh, such as uh, such as Tesla, who then developed different forms of radio communication. But I'm not going to go that back into history. And there's a lot of interesting things because you know there was a case when a ship had had moved, uh, and when the ship had moved, it had cut a, it had cut a wired cable, and when it cut that wired cable. The finding was that there was still some uh, transmission that was taking place. And so researchers then went and said, goodness, what is happening here? There was, you know, the cables got cut, yet there is some kind of transmission. And so the kind of inspired from there that, you know, there is potential for wireless communications. And so some of these kind of early forms of inventions might be very close to you. Um, and sometimes we just have to be able to think, and by the way, excuse the pun, Sometimes they may be invisible, like the case of wireless technology. Now, what has also happened is that uh, now on the picture, you see a set of mobile phones. And I fully recognize that uh, some of you, particularly for our audience today, because uh, you're at the high school, you may actually have not seen some of these uh, phones in this form. And what is interesting here is that these four, the, the mobile phones have decreased in size over time. Uh, and another thing that has happened is if you look at the mobile phones, there are antennas. These antennas have produced, uh, and now you see that the latest versions of the phone does not have a visible antenna, uh, whereas the antenna is now embedded. And that is because there is a relationship which we called Moore's law, where devices have become smaller. And at the same time, depending on the frequency that we use, there is an inverse relationship between, uh, loosely put, between component size or device size and the frequency that we use. So when you hear that we're using higher frequencies, then the size of your device is going to become smaller and smaller. Um, and that's important to, to think in terms of the type of frequencies that we're talking about in millimeter waves to give you an idea, and if you want to take a note, is that the, these mobile phones 
uh, are often using frequencies for, for telephone uh, or for voice. Uh, it might be in the 900 megahertz, and if you're using wireless communications such as Bluetooth, it would be at 2.4 gigahertz. Now, I also talked about how these, these phones have become smaller over time. And what has really made these phones smaller over time is the fact that these uh, things that are called transistors, which is next to the 1948 label, these transistors have become smaller and smaller. And today, we're able to fit more than a billion pieces uh, on, a, on a square, uh, you know, on, on a, on, in a space like two millimeter by two millimeters. So there is intense miniaturization that has occurred. And within your mobile device, you're likely to find these green boards, which we call uh, PC boards. And these PC ports uh, have a couple of these, these devices, which I'm going to try to see if I can pull here, is that these devices are, are called integrated circuits. So that little black piece within the green board is, an in, is called an integrated circuit. So the work that I do is actually in engineering of those little black integrated circuits that go onto the PC board, the green board that goes into your mobile device. And another interesting thing that I mentioned was that the antennas have actually diminished over time. And so the antennas are kind of embedded behind these PC boards. Now, the next thing is to, uh, to think about is this aspect of utilization of, uh, of data. So what has happened is if you look at since the 1980s to now, what has happened is that the amount of data that we consume has increased exponentially. Uh, and a lot of this exponential growth has happened because today we use a lot more smartphones. Um, and so smartphones are the biggest chunk of this data that is, uh, is consumed here uh, in, this blue, in this blue bar. And, um, and so what are the technology steps? So in the, in the, the prior, to, in, the, in the 80s, we had the first generation, which was called 1G uh, technology. In the 90s, the second generation came about uh, and then the third generation came about in 2000 and the fourth generation in 2010. So you can see these are typically 10 year steps when these generations have happened. And sometimes we have something in between that we may call three point, this is third generation, this is fourth generation that we may call 3.5 G. Uh, and when we move from fourth generation to fifth generation, we may have something called 4 G plus so there are some variances in the naming. Now it's also, uh, you know, the, 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 in parallel to this, what has also been happening is the uh, industrial revolutions have been taking place. And we are now in the fourth industrial revolution. And that basically means that the speed of computing and speed of communication has come together and Together with that, come th those two technologies coming together, another piece that has come about is of data. There's a lot more data which has been harvested from the internet, and this feeds a machine learning uh, system. And this machine learning system then allows for an intensification of automation. And that is loosely put together, referred to as fourth industrial revolution, the element of artificial intelligence. But behind the scene, you know, if you really have to make it work, you have to provide, like we did for traffic, we provided roads. Uh, when we had, you saw those busy roads between Pretoria and Johannesburg that I had in the earlier picture. And what we did was we had a road and we consulted with people, we looked at environmental factors, we looked at health factors, and we built and we made wider roads. And what we are trying to do here to move from the fourth generation to 4G plus to the fifth generation of 5G is we're effectively looking to widen the road so that we can carry more internet traffic. 
Now, something else has happened in parallel with our ability to have high, to the desire to have high speed is the fact that, you know, a lot of you would be, you know, three, four years ago, we took a lot more pictures. Now what you find is you're not only taking pictures from using your mobile phone, you're also taking video, like we're doing in this presentation today, is this is a video broadcast. So this means that we've got to be able to have space on our phones to be able to carry a lot more data. Now, this is an interesting picture. This is not about, this is about cost. So what you see here in this picture is there's a red line which uh, talks to a type of technology called hard disk, which uh, was a type of a magnetic drive that carried uh, information, which carried your data and these were big storage devices. I'll show you a picture of those just now. And in parallel to this was another kind of technology, uh, which is also used to store data, which is called solid state drive, which is depicted or shown in the yellow uh, graph. And solid state drive used to be pretty expensive. And hard drive used to be expensive, but hard drive, which is the red line, became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and became really cheap, became almost close to zero dollars. But solid state drive continued to remain expensive and it struggled to get to the zero uh, dollar mark, but something happened around 2012. And it was not the advancement of technology. What was happening was that a lot of hard drives were being shipped out of Thailand. And around that period, we were struck by a, by a, what, you know, Thailand is an, is a, is a part in part of the world, which is often hit by tsunamis. And so the tsunamis have hit Thailand at different parts in this decade period. And one such incident around 2012 meant that Thailand could no longer export these hard drives, which is on the red line. And suddenly that meant that the demand for solid state drives, the yellow line became higher and the cost became reduced of that. Now that was another major advancement because that meant that you could carry a small hard drive on your mobile phone and carry a lot of data. So now you have, it is like, if you think about a car on the road, now you can carry a lot more people in the same small space of that car, which means that on your mobile phone, you can now carry a lot more data. So in pictures, this is what happened. So once upon a time, we worked with the stones and we had stone paintings as the way that we stored information. And this then changed over time to a point where solid state drives came about and these solid state drives, they actually embed in your mobile phone. This means that when you are taking pictures on Facebook, videos on your, your phone, all of that can be stored on your phone, but that is not enough. On social media, you want to be able to repost, you want to be able to share that information with other people. And sharing means you want to have high-speed communication. And in parallel to this, what is also interesting is that your home, your mobile office, and these have lots of little devices. And these devices are just continuing to increase. And these devices are so-called things. Um, they also want to communicate uh, you know, from one to the other. And these devices tend to then have sensors, which we refer to broadly as the Internet of Things. Uh, and so you have the issue of people to people communication. You have the aspect of people to thing communication. And you also have the aspect of thing to thing communication. That means there is a lot of data traffic. That means that the road has to be widened or we have to add additional roads. 
Now, loosely explained, the aspect of adding additional roads is what we refer to as spectrum allocation in, in terms of frequency spectrum allocation. And frequency spectrum allocation is something that is regulated by a body in South Africa called ICASA, which is a, the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa. And ICASA then regulates who uses what frequencies and under what conditions so that it is safe for human usage. Now, on the right hand side, you see a picture of cell phones. And when you make a call or you want to send a data using WhatsApp, what happens is that your cell phone antenna then sends this, the antennas con uh, communicates to a base station. The data is received by the base station. The base station then sends it to another base station. And in the journey, it connects with other base stations on, on the road. Uh, to, to reach the cell phone on the other side or the receiver. And all of these is then provided by your mobile network provider. Now, this happens at a global scale. So there is a lot of data that is moving about uh, globally at all times. Now, in the lockdown period, we don't have a lot of planes that are moving. Uh, planes uh, are not moving, but data is moving, and the volume for data during this lockdown period has increased far, uh, uh, you know, several percentage more than than, nor than normal. Which means that our government, uh, to the ICASA body that I said earlier on, has allowed for temporary usage of so of some of these roads, or has made a frequency spectrum allocated on a temporary basis to providers so that they can enable communications so that you and others can access uh, presentations like this one virtually. Now, important here is that the world's amount of communication uh, monthly has increased to such a point that this is also on an exponential growth. And a lot of this is due to smartphones. So the blue picture is the smartphones that has continued uh, the increase in, in communication. This means, and I, I gave you the analogy earlier on, which was to widen the road. And this means that we have to look at the concept of widening the road when it comes to telecommunications. But we have to keep all those other things in mind that we have to do it with consultation with people so that they understand the benefit of the technology at the same time they understand the negatives of technology for example if all of us all the time have mobile phones and in, and when we sit around a dining table we're all on our phones we're not looking around we're not looking at our parents we're not looking at our friends and family uh, then we find each we find that our relationship with the person right next to each other can change because we are virtually not there, which means that there are also humanities and social considerations that we must keep in mind when we roll out technology uh, as it can lead to forms of depression, forms of loneliness. Uh, so there is a lot of good that technology brings, but there's also some negatives of technology. Now, I'm going into a bit more of the technical aspect. Uh, uh, which is really the core of which where I work. Now, the technology aspect, uh, the, when we talk about 5G, there are different frequencies that are allocated. Now, in South Africa at the moment, we have not gone on to these very high frequencies, which are in the 60 gigahertz range. And there are some reasons for that because it's still a very early, early form of technology. This frequency has been utilized uh, in the past for maybe two and a half decades. So it's not really a new frequency band, but what makes it interesting, uh, and this is the frequency, these are called, these are the frequency bands when, with, when I refer to them, for example, 10 gigahertz, 100 gigahertz, one terahertz, and so on. These are the frequency bands. Um, and we have uh, not utilized all of these bands for telecommunication uh, purposes. Um, and, and there are different reasons for it. Is sometimes, you know, you don't just build roads if you don't have the traffic. 
you must have the traffic. But, you know, sometimes you have to plan for an increase in traffic if your population is increasing. And similarly, you have to have a plan for when your data traffic will increase that you should have uh, either many roads or you should widen the road. And in this, pro this uh, approach that we're talking about here is looking at widening the road. And so, so we, we, are often, we have often used the word millimeter. So what does millimeter actually mean? So millimeter uh, wave is actually referring to a wavelength, which is denoted here by this character called lambda. It's a Greek character that says C is equal to lambda times F. So what is C? C is the speed of light. Lambda is the wavelength which is measured in as a distance, like in millimeters. And frequency is the frequency that you're working with. So 60 gigahertz would be a frequency. So when you plug in 60 gigahertz and you put in the speed of light, what you will end up getting is, is lambda. And lambda is in measured in millimeter. So if we are putting the frequency as 60 gigahertz, we are going to get a couple of millimeter, we are going to get a millimeter value for lambda, and therefore we refer to this technology as millimeter wave communication. Now, you know, often when we think about 5G, we are thinking about millimeter waves, and that's because there are some, lo there are some lower end frequencies, such as in the 28 gigahertz range, uh, which is used for 5G in a number of countries around the world, and that is also, uh, when you work out the lambda for that frequency, it will also work out to be in the millimeter, uh, millimeter range. And so thus, you also often think about 5G and millimeter wave in a synonymous way. But it, uh, it, it needn't necessarily be because th there are lower frequencies, which is sometimes called 4G+, plus, which is not necessarily truly millimeter, but that's about definitions. So I won't go too much into that, but you now know how to, to determine what is a millimeter wave or, or not. Now, another thing that is interesting about the 60 gigahertz specifically, which is the area in which I work in, is that the oxygen has the ability to attenuate or to reduce in value the strength of the signal. So if I have to communicate within a room, it's okay if I use 60 gigahertz, but if I go to a distance such as maybe a kilometer or a few hundred meters, you find that the strength of that signal automatically decreases. And that is called oxygen attenuation. And the way that we get by it is that we then have to put in masts very close to each other, or I call them base stations earlier on. I'm going to show that in a picture here. That means that you see these, these antennas have to be, you know, normally they can be, uh, you know, in the three kilometer range, but this means that they, with the 60 gigahertz, they have to be very close to each other. So on the right hand side, I have a picture from New York City. And what you see here is that, you know, you have lamp posts, each of these lamp posts have light and the lamp posts are actually close to each other. And these, when they're close to each other, uh, that's how close you have to be with this type of technology, which means, which poses a bit of a health issue. That means that, does it mean that your uh, antennas are so close, uh, close by and, and if they are, what should be the constraints? And one of the constraints that has been posed by bodies that regulate the power that is emitted by these mobile devices or by these uh, routers is to reduce the amount of power such that they, it is safe for human consumption. The other aspect is that sometimes when you have your mobile phone close to you, you know, I'm putting my phone close to me right now in the, in the video. When you have it close, you find that your face it becomes warm. And when your face becomes warm, that is a component of radiation that becomes close when it becomes, not, it, it's a component of heating that happens. And fortunately, our faces are reflective. 
So as long as the, the your new mobile device, it must emit a small, a very minuscule amount of power, uh, which is regulated by the uh, when the phones are manufactured, so that you don't have these negative impact of your of uh, of the energy or of the heat on your body. So I, I talked about that these antennas have to become very close to each other and that this is also shown in this, this uh, picture. In fact, these cells become closed and therefore they're called pico cells. Uh, you saw earlier on that I had macro, uh, which is the big cell and then the micro cell and then the pico cell when it becomes in the environment of your building. Now you don't always notice these antennas, you know, because they're nicely hidden in trees, for example. You see, there's a bit of art there uh, because the, the way that these, uh, these uh, masts are designed is they're often hidden and so you don't always see them uh, next to each other. Now, uh, what is, I talked about the data rate because you want high speed communication, you also want the range, uh, and then you also want power. So at the 60 gigahertz, you are able to try to maximize these three uh, together but I did say that the range is limited because of oxygen attenuation. So the way that that is solved is it is solved by putting these uh, antennas close to each other in a pico cell. Uh, so I won't go into the mathematics, but if you're interested in, in searching Shannon theorem, uh, it is an important theorem that is used in this, in this discipline. Now, I won't also go about uh, too much into details here, but this is the way that the technology is integrated uh, within your mobile phone uh, and at, the, at your communication stations. Uh, and one important piece here is called, is the piece of, of the integrated circuit or IC. An integrated circuit is a prime area in which my research group works. So a very important contribution that is here uh, is that we utilize a technology called silicon germanium. Now silicon is derived from sand. So it is abundantly available uh, and it is what most computing chips are made of today is made of silicon. And so when you think about silicon germanium, it's a technology that can be easily integrated into existing manufacturing systems. Now there's something else that is very special about silicon germanium. And if you think of these two lines that I have here, and if you think of this space as a road, and if you are standing where this electron is standing, and if you are the electron, and if you have to cross the road, the one way of crossing the road very quickly is if I give you a big push and you jump up and you have high mobility and you jump across the road. That is called electron mobility. So silicon germanium gives you a high electron mobility that enables you to jump across the road very quickly. Now in electronics, we call that road band gap. Now there's something else that is very interesting about silicon germanium. And that is that that road is called band gap. And now imagine that you're, you're standing across a road that you need to cross. And as you're watching this road, the road becomes very narrow and you're able to just instantly walk over. Imagine that you don't have to cross the road to become smaller. That is called band gap and in silicon germanium the band gap becomes small it becomes narrow it is low in value which means it is like that road that compresses that means that the electron have a push called electron mobility at the same time the band gap is low which gives us a very high speed of crossing which means that the speed increases that's how you get those high data rates because the switching is much quicker. Now, the second part that we also use in our research group, group is there's something called nature. You know, we have nature like mother nature, where there are, there are things that often many engineers will say that those are practical constraints or they are non-ideal. We don't have control over what is non-ideal. 
So we try to model what is non-ideal and we try to use nature and we construct components out of this nature. Think about it like this. If you have a lemon and you put into the lemon a nail and you try to take a low energy, a low power bulb, you can light up that bulb with that lemon. Now, it is the same kind of thinking that we say, why are the spaces which are non-ideal and how can we use that to construct an electrical signal and model that electrical component? And so we do this two combination of things in a very innovative way, in a very almost like an art. And when we think about this artistically, we find that the mathematics then explains what it is that we have done. And so this is a complicated picture of how this uh, manufacture, uh, manufacturing works. Basically what happens here is that the chip is designed and then we send it to a fabrication plant, sometimes in the US, sometimes in China, sometimes in Europe, and then the chip is prototyped, the design is prototyped, and then we, it comes back to South Africa where we do the measurement. And then if it works, we develop a patent and then we try to commercialize it. Uh, or we try to, we publish. Uh, so in the university, we try to patent and publish and often in that order. And that then in, allows you to have the kind of technologies that enables high speed mobile communication. Now I'm getting almost to the last uh, slide. Now I did say earlier on that when you build that roads, it's really important to think about not only the technology aspect, but to think about the environmental aspects or the earth systems, to think about the social implications of technology, and very important to think about the geopolitics, because technology means that your, your borders between countries have now become virtualized. And that virtualization means that the order of how politics works also changes. And so we have to think about also the political aspects of technology. So sometimes simply because you have technology that works does not mean that the technology will be realized because of a, a, multi, a, a multiple, multiple set of constraints or opportunities that we have to consider. And the sustainable development goals that the United Nations derived in uh, and, uh, and officiated in 2015 is a good reference point for this. Now, in conclusion, what we are proposing here is the meaningful advancement of technology that enables high-speed communication such that we can develop the techno-economics component, keeping in mind the aspects of health, of, envir of the environment, of the social dynamics and also realizing the geopolitical aspects of advancements that come about with technology. I present here lastly a picture of a project, a community project that we were involved in. It was an engineering project in community service and this uh, advancement uh, allowed us to, um, to enable uh, this lady in a rural area to uh, access markets with her mobile phone. So, you know, I know that some of you are considering careers. You are in grade 10, you're looking at subjects, you know, at grade 11 and 12, and subjects that will enable you to access a program in STEAM. And there are multiple accesses, uh, you know, points for it. But science, mathematics, and the role of English and your, your other language plays a very important role when it comes to to uh, taking on uh, STEAM-oriented uh, careers. Now, our group has also published extensively. In fact, these are nine books that we have published and we're producing a 10th book uh, this year. And so these are some uh, reference uh, uh, books if you're interested and a very interesting point, particularly for uh, the emerging economy for South Africa is this book on last mile internet access for emerging economies which talks about a hybrid approach to bring about high-speed uh, communication also for, for rural uh, areas. And that may be of interest uh, in terms of, your, of, your, of the thinking approach 
because we want to have technologies that also enable inclusivity. So with these words, I'm going to pause. Uh, we have, I think, about 15 minutes for uh, some Q&A. Um, and uh, my contact details are also here uh, if you want to engage with me uh, afterwards. Um, so I'm going to, to switch uh, over to Chris for the, for the Q&A. Uh, Chris, over to you. Thanks so much, Prof. Thank you for that incredibly interesting presentation. Um, I must say it explained in very easy terms a topic that um, is very arcane and um, I'm sure we, I know nothing about, so thank you for that. So we have got three guests on the line. Um, firstly, um, our, our first question is going to um, come from Radana um, Khan. She is a Czech Women alumna, and she's the founder of um, our CASI Maths program at Rosa Parks Library. I'm sure our CASI Maths students will know her very well. And she is also an entrepreneur in the um, IT space, in the technology space. And um, as I said, the, the founder of Cassie Maths, which is a program that runs at Rosa Parks Library. So, Redwana, over to you for your question to Prof. Sina. Thanks, Chris. Um, hi, Prof. Sina. Thank you so much for that insightful talk. Um, there were lots of new things that I learned as well. It was uh, really interesting. So, I think my question is on behalf of the Gassimet students. Um, I know some of them are watching right now and I will be showing them the video later uh, this month when hopefully or later next month once this lockdown is over. Um, but if some of these students are interested in studying more about your subject matter, so things like networks and telecommunications, etc., what would your advice be uh, to them in order for them to explore this topic a little bit further while still being in school? Great. Uh, so, of course, uh, the you know the school subject. Look, uh, there are different ways. You know, people contribute to technologies differently. Some would contribute by looking at the engineering aspects, uh, kind of the career that I have selected, uh, which then uh, requires a higher level of engagement in science and mathematics. Uh, we often say that mathematics is the language of engineers. Um, on the other hand, there are also there is also the aspect of the social sciences that relates to the technology. So some others would access technologies from a social dimension. We say Facebook is social media. Uh, so that would be another way of accessing uh, and developing interest. Uh, there is a game that, that came about a few years ago called Angry Birds. Maybe some of you still play that. And if you look at the Angry Birds, you know they say that it was the artist that on the that uh, drew the picture of a very frustrated programmer. And that painting or picture got people's interest. So that is another way of being able to access it. So I always think about, you know, that we are a little bit, we are different people, but we are something like a fish. And we, a fish has different ways of, you know, the, the, if you ask a fish to climb a tree, as the saying goes, it will not succeed. But a fish in water, will succeed. And so we have to be able to find what is that water for us. And it would be through that water that one can make a contribution also to this technology. Uh, and so I haven't quite answered you exactly because I want to ensure that persons are encouraged to go along with their interest and then uh, deep dive with that interest into this area of this technology. Thank you, Ridwana. Awesome, thank you so much, Prof. Sina. That was a great answer. Also, I can totally relate to that Angry Birds pro uh, programmer uh, reference you made. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Prof. We've got an, another guest on the line um, taking part in this um, Facebook Live. Her name is Kim Paturi. She is a member of the um, um, Soweto um, 
global shapers. I'm the Soweto Hub for global shapers and a director and founder of a, a telecommunications company called um, Level X. And um, she's a great partner of us at Rosa Parks Library and uh, co presents many um, entrepreneurship question, um, programs. And so she also has a question for you. Hi, Prof. Um, thank you for the lovely presentation. I'm actually bamboozled. That was actually very simple and very easy to understand. Um, hi to everyone at home. So my question is going to represent youth and entrepreneurs specifically. I would say as an entrepreneur in the telecommunications space, how do you best position yourself for the coming market? Um, because as we've seen with COVID, even our way of working has changed. So how do we best uh, position ourselves for the future of the world of work? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kim. Kim, I'm going to uh, think about a person who really made, uh, by the way, this gentleman was considered to be very unsuccessful, uh, who, uh, you know, led to the, uh, you know, to, to uh, Jack Ma, who led to the company called Alibaba, this big e-commerce company around the world. And, you know, when you think about entrepreneurs, I want you to focus on the first three characters. It's E-N-T, right? E-N-T. And if I change those characters a little bit, I get net. E-N-T and net, just changing the characters, that's all. And from there, you get something called a netpreneur. And the future world of work is about netpreneurs. And netpreneurs means that those, if we were, if we had lots of netpreneurs during the lockdown period, we would be less worried about our economic challenges because we would have had people that would have been able to work even during this time. Of course, for that, you do need to have those roads uh, that I talked about. Uh, you must have high bandwidth and you must have cost-effective bandwidth. Uh, and those are our are, uh, are aspects to, to think uh, about. So. To answer your question is to change from entrepreneurs to netpreneurs and from there to think in the virtual space the type of jobs that can be created. Uh, and, and lastly, I want to, to pitch that when you think about the founder of Apple, you often think about Steve Jobs. We often think about the person, we think about Steve, but we forget the surname Jobs, and excuse the pun, but Apple created many more jobs. And that's something that we must remember them for. Uh, and we must remember Steve Jobs for. So uh, to answer your question, Kim, is to think in terms of jobs in the virtual space. And there is quite a bit of uh, apps that you can use already on your mobile phone, like Google Digital Skills for Africa which is free to learn uh, on, your, on your mobile phone, which can very quickly enable you to develop apps and then to start thinking in terms of the, um, of the workflow that coders uh, think about, uh, like, like Rudwana, like the work that you are doing, Kim. That's what I would advise. All right, thank you very much, Prof. That was quite insightful. Thanks, Prof. Then we have a question from one of our viewers um, on the live event. Um, it's a question from Tembi. She says, hello, what is the relation between 5G and fiber optic? And with a high consumption of data in South Africa, isn't it supposed to be cheaper to use data? However, it's just becoming more and more expensive. Yeah. So the, the important to the, these two technologies uh, fiber and uh, fiber optic and 5G, they needn't to be thought about as, you know, they can be two separate technologies. In other words, you can use wireless technology on its own, connecting to the base stations, but you can also use fiber optics in conjunction with 5G or with millimeter wave. And in our book on the last mile, what we actually advocate there is to take 
the fiber optics into various parts of the country uh, because it is, you know, let's ex excuse the pun, it is hardwired into the ground. And it is at the end stations, like you take electricity from one city to the other. And then once you have, you have some kind of a base station there or a substation in electrical terms. And from there you have lamps that are put into that, into that suburb or that village or that town. And so it's very similar here. You take fiber to the different areas and from there, there you take uh, clothes by, uh, you know, pico cells. Um, and that's how you would then bring about the communication. Now the cost aspect. We have to create more roads so that we can put more data onto the roads. And the more data we have, it means we have more people who are paying taxes. And when you have more people who are paying taxes or paying more, you're able to reduce the tax for each individual user. And that is the similar kind of thing here is that we're looking at uh, reducing the cost. And I would say that South Africa, especially during the COVID period, you can see is reducing the cost of, uh, of data. The monthly data bundles uh, will continue to reduce. And I must say that the, our president, President Ramaphosa has also cons constituted something called the Presidential Commission on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which really talks about how to leverage data more and more for people, which means that the cost of the data would have to reduce so that we can take an inclusive approach and not continue to have this area of digital inequality as we have today. Uh, and so the cost is an aspect which I am hopeful about. And I do think that the cost will reduce by way of combining the right technologies and at the right point to ultimately deliver an inclusive solution. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, so we also have, of course, our American Spaces Assistant on the line, um, Ernest Asha, who runs our um, STEM clubs at our American Spaces, uh, the one in Western area, the one in Mang Hong, and of course, Rosa Parks. And he also has a question for you, Prof. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, Prof, I think in South Africa, we, we, we don't speak much about postgraduate studies um, and how it's important for us to encourage maybe learners to, to you know, aggressively venture into postgraduate studies. What, what is your thinking around this whole concept of South Africa being a research hub? Um, and how can we have more influence in the world if we have that? So how does that play into uh, economic activities? And um, lastly, on our side, I would say, in terms of uh, technology, best ways of adapting? Should we continuously adapt like we are doing now to whatever technologies that are coming out from the world? Or can we find ways of being more, um, more proactive in terms of uh, initiating some technologies like you are doing? So how do we do that at a larger scale, considering that there are many demands like the NDP says that we need to have 5% economic growth? How do we realize that through using academics? Yeah, thank you very much. So I think, uh, Alist, uh, I think that the postgraduate component is an interesting component. What, we, what is happening around the world is that the undergraduate qualifications are becoming more and more multidisciplinary and are becoming much more general. And with the advancement, for example, now you, know, you have a lot more information that comes about at your disposal, at your fingertips. So the level and desire for specialization has uh, increased. And specialization often occurs at the postgraduate level. It needn't be a specialization in one area. It can still be specialization keeping the interface with, with other disciplines. Uh, on the, on the, so the, the, that area of specialization has, it's a growing demand around the world. In fact, um, the, the other aspect is 
I don't know if there is not always, if there is a pure issue of a lack of interest on part of South African students. I think the reality is the economic inequality reality of South Africa. A lot of our students want to do postgraduate studies, but they have to serve their families back home. This means that they have to try and go and find work. Now, in the current economic climate, somehow it means that the economy is not growing means you don't have enough jobs. So we are finding an increasing number of students that are coming into the university. Now, what I would encourage here is to take an approach to mix the aspect of research and innovation with the component of entrepreneurship and netpreneurship. And so at the University of Johannesburg, we have put uh, together an incubation program which feeds with your postgraduate qualification, such that what you do in terms of re research as a conversion component to innovation and commercialization. And that value chain working in hand in hand with the private sector and government players creates a new ecosystem. And there are problems, for example, the issue of multilingualism, if you try to once people have recorded this session and you try, if you display this on YouTube and you try to convert this into Zulu, you would immediately find that the diction is limited in Zulu. And that means we have unique opportunities where we can use technologies to advance the South African agenda. Um, and likewise, you have uh, places, uh, ge geographical areas, um, and the important thing is to realize that data is a currency and how we monetize that for the benefit of people would be a new form of the future economy. And the sooner we get grasp of that, we have found the new form of gold. So I would, to, uh, the other part about was adopt or adapt. You actually only talk about adapt. I don't think we have, a, we have to contribute into the global world. Uh, data is intellectual property and the, uh, it's a currency. And like when we exchange currency, there are trade conditions and trade agreements that are developed uh, and they are sophisticated. They are about arguments, they're about geopolitics. They're about protecting interests of um, um, multiple people. And that means that uh, we will not only be uh, persons who will adapt, but we will also contribute to have, ensure a mutual approach. And one should not underestimate South Africa. In fact, I'm writing an article, Ernest, which will appear most likely on Friday, which talks about uh, the role for South Africa to actually create a cost-effective learning management system for our service to the TVETs, for our service to universities that do not have a sophisticated learning management system. And South Africa creates and competes with the world when it comes to the big square kilometer antenna project, which is the largest science project in the world and it is hosted in the Karoo, uh, of course, with partners across the continent with Australia. But who would have thought that South Africa would be able to win such a project? It was, of course, ingenuity initially from on the part of Nelson Mandela, then of Thabo Mbeki, to recognize that the empty space of the Karoo, which, is, which does not have frequencies, offers the world a unique opportunity to listen to the universe. So where we often have nothing, we actually have everything. It is about how we harvest that opportunity. Uh, and there are many other examples of that that has been developed in South Africa. And I think that we have to be able to harvest those strengths to be benefit uh, ultimately of, 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 ultimately I would say of the continent but of course, uh, starting with South Africa first. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, we'll definitely share the presentation with the STEM clubs in Bloemfontein and Western area. And we hope uh, after the lockdown, 
uh, you'll be able to join us in person at some point. Thank you very much, Prof. Thanks, Prof. I know you almost have to go. You don't have much time left. Uh, thank you so much for your valuable, uh, valuable time this afternoon. I think we might have time for one last question from one of our viewers. Um, okay. okay. So Tsepo Muketi um, asks, do you think South Africa or Africa in general is ready for the 5G shift, 5G shift in communication, um, thereby enabling the fourth industrial revolution and the internet of things? When China is already talking about 6G and has, have start, has started to build smart cities. Yeah, I think that there are three reasons. The first is that the continent Africa has the youngest population in the world. Uh, this means that uh, I'm talking about on average. This means that you know the youth has have a greater appetite when it comes to technology. So I think that is the first reason why I would say yes. Ultimately, you must have people that have the ability and the willingness. Second, is that we do not have very strong infrastructure such that we don't have a road, for example, between Cape and Cairo. But we do have wireless communications. We do have communication networks in the virtual world that connect Cairo and the Cape. Now, areas where you don't always have the infrastructure, it means you can leapfrog into new areas and innovate to find ways of solving problems in, a, in ways that has never happened before. I think that the, the third aspect is that there is, you know, we don't always have, you know, the, the Areas where you know, the aspect of uh, economic growth is required uh, because we must have jobs, we must have inclusivity, and we must develop this for, for everybody. Um, it means that we have, you know, out, out of necessity, it means we have to work harder. Uh, it means that we have to uh, you know, think out of the box. Sometimes we say that we have to not only think inside the box, not only out of the box, we also have to think without the box. Um, and uh, that means we have to take away those constraints. So in, in, in summary, what I will say is that yes, you know, China is looking at 60, by the way, our, our 10th book uh, deals with 6G uh, together with some partners in Finland. And, but 6G is a bit of 5G plus uh, at the moment. It's, it starts to engage with the arena where things would communicate at high speeds with one another. And I'm sure you can think about many socio-economic, environmental health uh, impact of that type of technology. Um, but I would leave you with one last uh, statement that if you put down the characters, especially for the learners, and if you put down the characters and if you write it down on a piece of paper, and if you write down opportunity is nowhere, if you write the characters down on, the, on a piece of paper and you shift the gaps, you shift the gaps of this sentence, you will find opportunity is now here. It's the same characters. It is just about shifting the gaps. And that's what we have to be doing. And that's what we have to be thinking is when we shift the gaps, we find new gaps and we find new ways of contributing into the scientific body of knowledge. That's all we have to do. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Prof. That was absolutely uh, very interesting and inspiring. And we hope to have you on in the near future for another Facebook Live session, um, another very interesting topic. So thank you for that. And that means we are at the end of this afternoon's Facebook Live session. All that I'm left with to do is to just remind everyone that we have a um, Q&A session tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock um, with um, the, grant, the small grants, community grants coordinator at the embassy in um, Pretoria. On, and she will answer some of your questions on um, how to write a good grant proposal. And with that, I'll say goodbye also to everyone who has uh, tuned in.
and see you tomorrow afternoon. Bye bye. Bye, bro. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Ernest. And thanks to the team and the audience. Okay, bye bye.